Let us fight against the Walmartization of our country, where workers are paid poverty wages with no benefits. Let's fight for a society that invests in health care and in education and our children, and not a society that invests billions of wars for war and devastation in Afghanistan, Iraq, and in Syria. I'm very happy and excited to welcome to the stage of GRIT TV Kent Wong. He's director of the UCLA Labor Center. He's also vice president of the California Federation of Teachers. Uh, Kent, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Talk a little bit about what the UCLA Labor Center does, just quickly. I've been the director of the Labor Center for over 20 years. We are a research and education center within the university. And we not only teach classes to students at UCLA, we also develop a lot of union leadership. So we have union leadership programs, conferences, educational activities to grow a new labor movement. And what are workers facing, broadly defined, in LA these days? Los Angeles is the best of times and the worst of times. We have the largest gap in uh, wealth of any other major city in the country. Some of the wealthiest corporations and individuals in the world live in Los Angeles. On the other hand, we have uh, millions of workers who live and work in poverty. So uh, this is something that the labor movement is uh, uniquely positioned to address. We've had decades now of people in America getting a message that unions are old hat, something that grandparents belong to, something that isn't really relevant in today's work life or life at all. Uh, what difference does being a member of a union make to workers like those that you work with at the center? What we've actually seen here in California is that union membership is on the rise. Over 100,000 new uh, workers were organized into unions in uh, the year 2012. And uh, unions provide uh, a voice for workers. They also provide 30% more in wages and benefits than their non-union counterparts. How so do they do across that? the board, nurses, a, a union nurse makes 30% more in wages and benefits than a non-union nurse. A union janitor, 30% more than a non-union janitor a union hotel worker, 30% more than a non-union hotel worker. And how does that come about? That comes about through collective bargaining, through having a voice on the job, and through ensuring that workers' uh, rights are respected. How did you come up into this work? My first uh, job within the labor movement was as a boycott organizer for the United Farm Workers of America under the leadership of Cesar Chavez. And that experience changed my life because here you had a group of farm workers, who did not have formal education, who were undocumented, who were working in the fields of California. And yet, through their collective action, through joining together, they were able to take on some of the most powerful interests within our society and win. So that's what the farm workers taught me, and that's why I've decided to become a labor attorney and a labor educator. From the farm workers to the home care workers to justice for janitors, some of the most exciting and successful labor mobilizations of our times have come out of California and out of LA in particular. How do you explain that, understand it? What makes the difference here? I have been blessed to be able to be part of this movement and to watch it grow. And a critical factor has been labor's willingness to change and to build active labor community partnerships, especially with immigrant workers. When we look around to see the new working class here in Los Angeles, there are millions and millions of immigrant workers. And immigrant workers have been at the forefront of some of the most dynamic organizing campaigns, not only here in Los Angeles, but across the country. And why do you think that is? Just digging down a little bit, is it because those are the workers who have the least to lose? Or is it because those workers, I don't know, come from countries perhaps where the labor tradition isn't as disparaged as it is in this country. Well, one myth is that although union density in this country is quite low, about 11 percent, uh, the myth is that, well, workers aren't organized. The reality is that workers are organized in many different ways. They're organized in community centers, in churches, in community organizations. And so with immigrant workers, although traditionally they have not been part of the formal U.S. labor movement, they have their own forms of organization. And so when unions reach out to them, when they tap into their own forms of organizations, and when they identify leaders who are committed to the same values as the labor movement, they have been remarkably successful in bringing in wave upon wave of new workers who are among the uh, strongest leaders in the American labor movement today. What's been going on in Orange County? 
We're thrilled about the developments in Orange County. Tapare Gabre has done an extraordinary job as the leader of the Orange County Labor Federation. He has built labor community partnerships. He has recruited and trained new generations of workers. And uh, now Orange County uh, has tremendous hope that didn't before exist, where now workers are standing up, are organizing, and we see tremendous potential for the future. 47% of Orange County voters voted for Obama in 2012. I never would have dreamed that could have been possible. And now the man responsible that you just named is moving to become the vice president here, the, one of the vice presidents here at the AFL-CIO, a huge step. That's correct. Uh, Tafari Gabre is now nominated as the executive vice president, the first officer in the history of the American labor movement who is an immigrant himself and who is someone who has fought for and uh, built unions uh, throughout his career. And what does that mean in terms of the way the AFL is changing? I think it's a strong message that uh, this convention is about embracing diversity. This convention is about building labor community partnerships and understanding that unions have to change in order to be an effective force within our broader society. So the fact that uh, at the very highest levels the AFL-CIO is opening its doors to people of color, to immigrants, to women, to young workers reflects that the labor movement is doing the right thing and is serious about embracing a change agenda. Now, as somebody who teaches labor, you know that there are concerns in some parts of the labor movement that in any given workplace there are enough issues and worries and debates to be had, enough stuff to bring to the negotiating table, that some people fear mission creep when it comes to working with community groups around outside the workplace issues. How are you addressing that um, so that we still have a strong labor movement where it counts? We only need to look at our own history. Uh, the period of the largest rise in union density in this country was in the 1930s during the midst of the Great Depression. At that point, unions were not just fighting for bread and butter issues across the bargaining table. They were fighting for issues of civil rights, of human rights, of uh, worker justice and worker dignity. Uh, they were organizing unemployed councils. They were fighting for uh, basic uh, social rights that we now enjoy, things like social security, things like unemployment insurance, things that uh, expand well beyond the workplace itself. And that's how uh, labor unions were forged and built in this country, and that's what is going to lead to the revitalization of the U.S. labor movement today. You go back to a moment in history where all those good things happened, but they didn't include everybody. And they, in particular, didn't include workers of color, domestic workers, farm workers. Um, I sometimes have the feeling that the labor movement's asking for an opportunity to have a do-over. Uh, is it? Do it right this time? Do it different with everybody involved? You raise a very important point. When modern labor law was developed in this country, when the National Labor Relations Act was passed in the 1930s, is it explicitly excluded most workers of color, domestic workers, farm workers. It even included public sector workers, government workers. And now we need to correct that wrong. We need to go back and organize workers who have been historically excluded from protection of the American labor movement. And that's what we see today. When the domestic workers take center stage, when day laborers take center stage, uh, this is a new day for the American labor movement. Thanks so much for joining us, Kent. Thank you, and thank you for your great work.